and welcome to this week's Property Matters on Dublin South FM, the show that brings global trends to an Irish audience. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host for today is myself, Carol Tallon. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, we are, of course, recording remotely, so apologies for any poor sound quality. I'm now joined on the line by Ashlyn Keenan, Managing Director of AK Property Services. Ashlyn, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Carol. Um, Ashling, I, I know I I first met you actually as your book was coming out. So you might just for the estate and managing agents um, listening in, you might just actually give the title of your book and where it's available before we get started. Yes. So the title of my book is Owners Management Company Law and Best Practice. And it's available from Claris Press, who are the publishers. And that's clarispress.ie. Perfect. OK, thank you so much. So, look, you're navigating the particular challenges that multi-unit developments represent in this time of social distancing. So, look, you might just give me an overview of the kind of things you've been dealing with over the past kind of two weeks. Uh, yeah, Carol. So I have been working as a managing agent in throughout Ireland uh, for the past 20 years. So we represent uh, property owners in multi-unit developments and, and residents um, and in, in multi-unit developments. And what we have found uh, during uh, COVID-19 is that uh, when when you're living in shared spaces, such as multi-unit development, in particularly a, an apartment block, you kind of come up against more challenges than uh, many others who live in uh, other different types of housing situations. And um, uh, only two weeks ago, the housing agency held a webinar for, for those living in multi-unit developments to look at the challenges that are facing those. And there were a number of issues that arose, but the main issue um, that arose for people living in, in that type of a situation is social and physical distancing in the common area corridors and the gardens of apartment blocks. And um, that can be particularly problematic when um, you have so many people who are using the same shared spaces. And of course, we know that multi-unit development living it hinges upon operating in the collective and sharing spaces. And that's the direct opposite to what COVID-19 wants us to do uh, in terms of isolating and physical distancing. And that's what makes it particularly difficult. It makes it really stressful as well for residents in those settings, because, for example, you might have a family of three children and two adults in an apartment and that's five people who are trying to stay at home, number one. And also yes. when they are at home, then if they have a balcony and they want to go out on the balcony and the balcony is very near the next balcony. Um, if, if people in that family have concerns over a member of the family who have a health care problem, they might be vulnerable or they might be old. Um, the, this adds to the stress of, of living um, within such close proximity to, to others. Um, so, so in terms of the residents in the apartments, there are challenges that they face. And then for property owners who not all property owners live in the property that they own, and particularly with apartments, so many of them are mm -hmm. uh, not owner occupied. And so the landlords don't live there. But the landlords have issues that they face, like landlords, of course, they care about the welfare for their residents, in the, for their tenants in the apartments. And of course, that's a concern to them on one level. In another level, um, they, they're looking at paying the annual service charge and during COVID-19 with so many people out of work and constraints on financials is going to be a concern for property owners when it comes to managing uh, their investment property and the financials around whether rental income will come in or will they be able to pay the yeah. service charge themselves. You know, it, it occurs to me then that we're actually piling problems on top of existing problems because I know from um, previous interviews we've done in relation to um, the work that the housing agency is doing for multi-unit developments, we know that actually um, we have a very poor rate of compliance with paying management company fees. So is that to make this worse? Yeah, well, well, what I would say to you about that is... Um, that's m more of an historic problem from what I can see than anything else. Historically, the, the compliance rate for paying the annual service charge was very poor in this country. But that has improved significantly over the last year or two years with property owners. And it has improved um, because of the work that the housing agency have done, the Society of Chartered Surveyors, 
the law in the area of property management, property owners are beginning to are beginning to understand more about the payment of the annual service charge. And there's better information out there. And the law is a little bit more robust now than what it was. So over the la- and of course, uh, the property market and the economy has been doing so well over the last number of years that that whole situation has improved significantly. Now, that wouldn't mean that there wouldn't be um, a certain amount of non-compliance with the annual service charge. And what I would say in terms of that is that the owner's management companies throughout the country are in a far better position um, today in terms of uh, compliance of the service charge and the balance of funds in their bank accounts today than they ever have been. They're at their best in terms of what funds are available in their management company. And I really believe, and, and from all of the companies that we manage, we can see very clearly that they're so well financed and have 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 good funds in the account that it will really stand to them as we move forward and see what the implications, the financial implications will be for slow or non-payers over the next maybe year or two. And 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 that will probably be a consequence of COVID-19, that there will be more slower payers or more non-payers. Yes. But that will only be for a certain period of time. Uh, just like any recession, uh, you know, it, it has a period of time that it will last. Um, and for property owners in property management companies today, I would say, by and large, they're w- much more better positioned than they were in the past in that regard. OK, yeah, no, but that, that's a really positive thing. So that means they're better equipped to deal with what's coming down they the line as well, which is owners, positive. Yes, that's right. And property owners should um, not be as concerned about that as they would have been in the past. And um, they should be, uh, I suppose, cognizant of the past, uh, of the fact that, well, uh, we will take one one day at a time. We don't know for sure what the extent of the non-payers or the slow payers will be or the financial strain on the management company will be. It may not be as bad as we think and we are better financed than we have been in the past. And that is by and large almost every management company in the country that that would be the position from what I can see. OK, well, look, that seems like a more positive place than we might have expected. Um, now, Ashling, you also contributed to a recent webinar that was hosted by the Housing Agency in collaboration with the Law Society of Ireland and the Chartered Surveyors. Um, and, and this was really to highlight and address some of the um, some of the big issues faced by people living in multi-unit developments right now. You know, um, now, first of all, just to let listeners know that I will include a link to this webinar um, in the uh, on the iProperty Radio website so that people can actually follow, can actually link back into it. Um, But just on this, um, there are some things that maybe people might be very ill-equipped to deal with. So, for example, you know, you're continuing um, holding AGMs in the current in the current climate. So you might just explain, say, to estate and letting agents out there how you're managing to do that. Yeah. So um, every management company will have to have the annual general meeting once a year. And of course, during COVID-19, it's only natural that there's going to be lots of AGMs that were due to be held. And can they be held is the question and so on. And and this was raised in the webinar in terms of the, the position with regard to company law and what uh, uh, a management company can and cannot do. And um, the legal position is that an annual general meeting uh, can only be held um, uh, in, it, it can only be a legitimate annual general meeting um, if people are present in person to vote. Now, that would indicate that you can't hold the meeting online or on Zoom, if you like. Um, Present in person and voting, and then you've got your quorum. So so it, it can get quite technical. For example, if you have a group of property owners and they want to make sure that their AGM is legitimate and has a legal basis, and they get together in social distance. Now, the, the, our lockdown for COVID-19 has varied. In the beginning, we were allowed to get together providing that we social distance. But this week, there's That's a right. lockdown to stay at home. So what you, we've got to do is we've got to consider the, the guidelines and stay within them when it comes to what the government have issued on the one hand. And on the other hand, then we have to see what if there was a way around it to hold the AGM, how do you do it? So before this particular lockdown, you could social distance and get four people together, which would be the normal quorum for an annual general meeting. They could social distance and you could have 
a, a computer screen in the room with Zoom for all of the other members to come in on the meeting, make decisions, vote on issues, and that could be deemed to be legitimate and have a legal basis. Now, I don't know of any EGMs that took place that way, but just in terms of the technicalities and getting around it, that would have been one way. Um, the other thing then, of course, is that in terms of the period of COVID-19, now we know that within 15 months you can hold the annual general meeting. So, like, for example, if you have your meeting on the 10th of April 2019 and you're going to have your next meeting on the 10th of April 2020. Well, if with COVID-19 you can't, and um, there's always a number of months there within company law that, that you can vary that. So, so that would mean that you could have your meeting, you know, in another two months time or maybe three and still be within the time frame that company law um, sets out. Um, so you could defer it to a certain extent. You could uh, use social distancing depending on the lockdown measures by government. Um, mm -hmm. And then what we have been doing at AK Property Services, um, what I have found is in dealing with groups of owners, we, we have lots of different management companies that we work with, groups of owners where um, they tend to agree on everything in their management company. There are no issues. And when you have a group of owners like that, as a managing agent, you can you can approach them and you can say, your annual general meeting is due to be held next week. And um, we propose that we hold it um, online on a Zoom conference call. And the owners then can agree or not agree. And what we have found is that we've held loads of AGMs online by agreement with the owners. And once the owners uh, all agree to, to approve the budget and proceed with the business, then that can that can happen. The company moves along, the business gets done and, and all of the property owners are in agreement. But if issues arose and some owners did not agree, then there wouldn't be a legal basis for that. So it depends on which group of owners, because, of course, no two management companies are the same. Yeah, of course. And look, again, like all of these things, you know, sometimes you have to just step back and realise that all of these management companies are made up of a collection of individuals. And of course, it, it depends on their relationship, their commitment to the building. And again, whether they're they're living there themselves in some cases. Um, Ashing, you know, you and I had a, had a chat um, earlier in the week and I was really surprised at some of the issues you were dealing with. So, for example, you know, a, a lot of a lot of the conversation at the moment across the, the construction and planning and real estate sectors are about, you know, what's deemed to be an essential service. So I was really surprised at some of the calls you're getting for people who feel that maybe tasks have been have been neglected in their building. Um, so l let's talk about look what is essential. Like we we'll, we know that the shutdown we're in at the moment um, was uh, on, until uh, Sunday, the twelfth of April. Um, at the time of recording this, uh, we're recording this in advance of the show, of course, because we're operating remotely. Um, but by the time this airs, we are absolutely expecting that shutdown to be extended uh, by a period of a number of weeks at least. So in the period of shutdown. Have you a definitive list of what's deemed to be an essential service in terms of managing apartment blocks? Yeah, the government have been uh, quite clear um, in in uh, setting out what's an essential service and not because they have published it. And we can see from what they have initially published um, that essential service when it comes to an apartment block or, or even a housing state for any of the management companies, um, by and large, it was something that would be to do with health and safety and maintenance. So, for example, in an apartment block, if you if the car, common area corridors are to be cleaned, and um, the question that arises is, well, is cleaning essential during COVID nineteen? And of course, um, we we know that cleaning is even more essential during COVID nineteen than course. any other time. So to keep the common areas clean and to sanitize and to uh, focus on it even more so than any other time is important. And that is certainly an essential service. Um, now, actually, should we break that down? Should we break that down into, you know, cleaning is a very broad spectrum. So you mentioned to me that you got a phone call from somebody complaining that the windows hadn't been cleaned. Well, yeah, we did. I mean, we get property owners that query lots of different things all the time. So, for example, uh, where we would have had a programme for window cleaning to take place in spring, um, that that programme would not be deemed to be essential. And so that probably won't take place in spring until COVID-19 is over because it wouldn't be an essential service. And sometimes property owners uh, would ring up and query um, what is being done or not being done. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I, I think it's really important, though, for um, for certainly managing agents to be assertive and to confidently be able to state what is essential and what isn't essential, what will need to be pushed out until post restrictions. Um, but then in terms of uh, where things are demonstrably essential, so uh, um, emergency issues. So say there's a water leak or, you know, there's there's. Um, an issue that requires access to apartment blocks. You know, how are you managing with that at the moment? Well, Carl, that's particularly difficult. So, for example, um, if you have a water leak in an apartment block, um, and of course water leaks uh, occur, you know, pretty much by the more use that there is in an apartment. So one would imagine that uh, with apartments being as occupied, densely occupied as they are at the moment, that the risk of water leaks uh, would would be higher. Um, but in the event where, uh, you know, a pipe bursts in an apartment or a pump fails, a water pump fails and the water trickles down, it could be going down through three floors and we may need to get access to three apartments to trace the water leak, to fix the water leak. And the residents in those apartments are reluctant to let any contractors in. But of course, this is an emergency service because it's a flood. It will affect the electricity of every apartment, the heating of every apartment and the hot water and so on. So so it is an emergency. It does need to be addressed. And COVID-19 makes this particularly difficult. But um, like with everything else, it hinges upon the cooperation and the understanding of all parties involved. And that's the resident. It's the property owner. It's the managing agent. And it's the plumbing contractor. So, so it's about people coming together and just trying to do our best to get through it. OK, and look, a, a final word of advice um, for people before we let you go, Ashling. Well, what I would say to, to uh, all stakeholders who are involved in multi-unit development living and, you know, um, I, I would say that really it's affecting um, mostly those who are resident in apartment blocks and um, property owners who, who don't live there obviously will have their concerns about their own tenants. And really the message is that multi-unit development living hinges upon cooperation of all and it will work best when everybody works together. And there is no time okay. more so like COVID-19 when we need everybody to understand and to work together so that we can all come out of this as best we can. OK, look, that's that's exactly it, Ashling. Hopefully people will heed your advice. Um, we'll leave it there for now. Our thanks again to Ashling Keenan, Managing Director of AK Services and uh, Property Services. Um, I will, of course, include the link to the webinar and a link to where you can get Ashling's book for more resources. Um, we need to take a quick break now. Stay tuned. 93.9 Dublin South FM. And welcome back to Property Matters on Dublin South FM with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. I'm delighted to be joined remotely, of course, by Valerie O'Keefe, CEO of Clarity VP Consulting. Valerie, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Carol. Delighted to be involved on the show well, today. Well, I'm delighted you were able to join us because you've been writing about something that is not just relevant for the planning, construction and property industry, but probably relevant for every one of us, whether we run our own business or not. You, you're focusing um, at this time on the area around resilience. So, look, that's, that's in my mind, sometimes an overused word. So, Will you tell me what, to your mind, what resilience really is as, as a business leader? Well, it's a good point. Uh, you know, I mean, resilience is is bandied around a lot at the moment, especially. And as leaders in industry and leaders within construction, we're just expected, like with the flick of a switch, that we'll just kick into resilience mode. But we all know, like, there's various definitions of around resilience. But one that I love is the ability to kind of, um, you know, properly address and be prepared for anxiety and stress and, you know, for any eventuality. But the reality is, is that we're humans to begin with. Um, and certainly when I've been working with clients in the construction industry over the last and other industries as well, by the way, but there's a, a justifiable anxiety about what this pande pandemic is going to do and the impact it's going to have on our personal and professional lives. So the whole area of resilience has really been kind of um, been been focused on by, by everybody. Um, there's a great there's a great quote, actually, that uh, anxiety is a way of introducing you to your weakest self. And I think what I found working with clients and indeed myself, that over the last uh, couple of weeks, that your, the resilience has been rocked a bit. We've all been rocked yes. a little bit. Yeah. And what's happening there is that there's kind of, you know, there's a feeling of, of, of fear 
fear comes out as an emotion or disappointment. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of, you know, what, what also struck me is what's being activated at this time and what's going on. And sometimes old wounds can be touched by the situation. But the, the, the good, I suppose, the good news is that, you know, when we look at resilience and, you know, the innate, I suppose, um, opportunity within all of us, there's, a, there's an opportunity for us to kind of look to new belief systems and to look forward in a new way. Uh, easier said than done, of course. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Actually, I think you've hit on a really important, but yet very um, understated point there, old wounds. Um, I mean, this is coming within a decade of probably the most traumatic time in Ireland's construction and and planning on property industries. And so these old wounds weren't quite old enough, you know, they weren't properly healed. Yes. And so I think that that's a really important point. You know, like I, I think in one way, um, the industry is much more resilient now than sure. it was a decade ago. But Absolutely. with old wounds, you know, these are essentially things that trigger us. And that's mm. one of the things that I've seen over the past couple of weeks. You know, people are, you know, flashing back very quickly to these yes. very traumatic times that we experienced, that, that most of us experienced about a decade ago. And mm. and that's, that's something that's um, maybe taken people by surprise, you know, well, I mean, are you finding that? What are you seeing at the moment? I am absolutely. I'm finding that it's it's very interesting, including myself. Even a couple of weeks ago, when this all started, that you know, you kind of feel that you know, well, I've been here before. Um, there are old wounds. I don't want to talk about the old wounds. I want to kind of get on with it. But then to realise that there's a huge amount that's outside our control. Mm -hmm. And there's it's OK. You know, it's it's very important to take back control, um, which which is which is really important as leaders in, in our industry. But it was interesting. I was listening to a podcast yesterday by um, Professor Ian Robertson. He's in the Global Brain Institute in Trinity. And he talked a little bit more about stress and anxiety. And the more we understand about it, at least then we're able to process it and then make choices. Looking back to old wounds, what happens? He talks about the fact that the stress is there's a perception is the demand it can place on you can exceed your ability to deal with things. Um, and this can result in the emotion of anxiety. And anxiety then is a great disruptor of our thinking. Mm -hmm. It absolutely calls away our attention because we feel under threat. You know, so we, we've reverted back to a bit of that from previous wounds. But but again, you know, what, what I'm talking about to clients in the industry is not to forget of, you know, we've all had bumps in the road. We've all had issues that have affected us, but we've also been more resilient even than we might have even thought. And I think it's important that we process the the the, um, the feelings that we're feeling at the moment and to, to, to not kind of suppress it too much, mm -hmm. but to recognise as well that it's very important for all of us as humans and as leaders within industry to move forward uh, as best we can. Yeah, and look, that is definitely something that's easier than, uh, it's easier said than done. And one thing that um, I remember from, you know, maybe a decade ago trying to navigate out of uncertainty at that time, you know, like, I mean, you mentioned there about uh, Professor Ian Robertson's talk. And one of the great things about capacity is that we generally don't know our capacity until it's tested. And this Absolutely. is this is one way to see. But, um, you know, it's very difficult to take in everything at once. And mm -hmm. and I think that's what's happening at the moment. This is all um, in its totality. Uh, this is a lot because you're talking about the human cost and public health and then sure. you're into the economic cost. And if you're running a business, then you're conscious of, um, you know, that you've got the livelihoods of your employees Absolutely. and their families in your hands as well. So a lot of that can feel out of control. So, I mean, are there are there techniques that people can employ just to even slow down enough to take one challenge at a time? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, particularly in, in the construction industry, there's been huge disruption. And as you quite rightly say, protecting staff and protecting sites and, and keeping business and operations kind of afloat are really key, not to mention security and protection of sites, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge amount going on for our leaders at the moment. But my advice would always be start with yourself. Mm -hmm. Bring it back to what you can control. There's a huge amount that are out, that's outside everybody's control, but you can control certain elements. You can you can control how you engage with what's going on, how you interact with what's going on, and how you influence what's going on. So, having a sense of yourself about what good looks like for you over the next couple of weeks, I would have devised based on client feedback a 90 day plan aid memoir that I kind of mm -hmm. I'd heard about on a previous podcast. Enda McNulty spoke about it, and I just it always struck a chord with me that 90 days 
days, it's three months. It's not a huge amount of time, but it is a time actually to put focus because actually as humans, we like to have focus and structure and it helps us, as you say, overcome some of this kind of um, distraction that's going on. So the 90 day plan is really key. The first component of that is about leaders. What do you want to achieve over the next 90 days as a leader? How can you take back control and at least develop your leadership skills or tie them up even more? What do you want to be remembered for? You know, if you meet somebody in a couple of years time saying that worked with you and they look back and say, I remember you during that time. You really were calm. You were considered and you were consistent in what you said to me. You know, so again, so the, the, the I think 90 days is a really good kind of um, segment of time that's not too long for people to kind of take a little bit of focus on. But again, you know, if anybody, if any of the listeners wants access to that, I can give you a link afterwards. But, you know, it breaks it down into then, of course, your staffing. Then what are you saying? What's the vision for, for the company, even in the shorter term? Mm-hmm. So, again, being consistent in your communication. I mean, dialing up communication, relentless communication in a crisis is what the, the experts say. And I've lived through crisis and so have you. And I've lived with and I've worked with brilliant leaders and not so brilliant leaders, mm-hmm. but the brilliant ones took control, knew where they were going themselves, led the team then afterwards. So knowing where you want to go first and then leading the team, it's easier to lead a team after that. Staying in a little bit and planning in relation to where the business, what's happening with your clients. There's many, many different facets of this. But, you know, the fundamentals are that you're you're staying calm and you're not letting this overcome you or take control of you. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's a very interesting, um, well, first of all, neuroplasticity. And I'm not, you know, I'm just fascinated by the brain, but you know, again, understanding the brain and how it works and how it can support you through this time. You know, what what does it mean? It's the brain's ability to form new connections and pathways and change how the circuits are wired and its ability to change. So understanding and shifting into that mode and kind of, you know, parking some of the negativity as best you can, but recognizing then with the plan structure and good support around you, actually, you can take steps forward. It doesn't have to be giant steps, but one step at a time. Do you think there's an element of, um, you know, I I think when you talk about the neuroplasticity of of the brain and how we can create, I, I, I don't know, are people aware just how quickly our brains can actually create new new neural pathways. Because mm-hmm. I know, uh, I think it's Dr. Joe Dispenza writes about this um, he does, exceptionally yeah. well. And, he, and you know, for anybody who's in any way interested in this, even at its most simplest level down for habits or habit making or habit breaking, mm-hmm. you know, there's some actually really good resources on YouTube that simplify it, you know, yeah. to a great level. And but the, But there's a tendency to think that some people uh, maybe are innately more able and they're innately mm. more resilient. And by the way, I I kind of fall into the camp where I do believe that some people are innately more, um, uh, I suppose, built to withstand um, to withstand an awful lot more. And maybe there's a, a bit of innate resilience. But by the same token, I do believe it's like a muscle that can be that can be built and trained. And this is where I love the idea of your ninety days because yeah. it. It, I mean, it really helps people to set a plan in place. You know, look, one of the things, and I don't know how you feel about this, but, you mm-hmm. know, I see huge opportunity for thought leadership here. Yeah. And, and I don't mean that in any sort of opportunistic way. Quite quite simply, I, I think our Taoiseach summed it up very well. We are all in this together. Sure. But there will be some people who can do more. There'll be some people who can, um, I suppose, show a bit of clarity that can show guidance that can lead the way out through the the confusion and this is this is where leaders are born through times of crisis and you know i look i i certainly i see it in the industry particularly across our clients they definitely fall into two camps the people who want to keep their head down batten down the hatches and and not communicate so effectively go dark in terms of communication mm. and you know it's such an unwise thing to do at this time but mm. then you know, I, I understand there's confidence required to be able to speak out in times of such uncertainty. You know, it does it does take a risk. Um, you know, so you have to really believe in what you're saying, have the conviction and, and really back it up. Yeah, I, th- I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's an opportunity here for leaders to really step out of their comfort zone in some ways. Uh, yes, they're definitely, I've worked with leaders in the past where they've gone into a shell and they're not to be seen on the floor, yeah. especially when I was younger and different things happened in my career and I just thought, God, where's the leader gone? And then all of a sudden, leadership happens on the floor in the office from somebody without a title. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's really inspiring to recognize. And even if you're listening to this and you're on a team, which may not have the, the, you know, the the leadership title per se, there's nothing to stop each of us individually leading ourselves in a new way. This is a real opportunity. Everybody is entitled to a trajectory of growth irrespective of which company they work in. And it's just, I suppose, people who are who have had a chance and the privilege sometimes to work with mentors and people like that to get a sense of self-awareness and then to be able to perhaps dial up or to use some of these tactics to help them in various scenarios. I don't I don't think somebody is naturally stronger than another um, genetically. I think it just is, is based on as people, people who, who are around you, supporting you. In fact, the great Robin Sharma talks about, you know, he says genius is less about genetics. And I think leadership is less about genetics. It's more about four key things. He talks about rituals and routines. Mm -hmm. He talks about the habits that you form on a daily basis. Are you getting up early? Are you kind of going for that run in the morning? Are you immersing yourself for a certain part of of your week in strategic thinking or reading? The fourth area then is the environment that you find yourself working in, uh, that you make it as, as, uh, I suppose, collaborative and, I suppose, insightful and also um, inspiring as as possible. So there are the four kind of key areas that help maintain resilience and indeed not just resilience, but as a leader, how you grow and develop. I just thought it was very um it resonated with me yeah absolutely and you know can i can i posit a fifth one there um you know i mean there has to be some element of bravery or uh willingness to take a risk and willingness to be wrong you know if we're asking people to um step forward in uncertain times then obviously the chance of you know get putting a foot wrong is going to be higher and you know, that has to be something, you know, that, that people are willing to to risk. They must be willing to be brave uh, and step forward. You know, does that come into this? It does. You're absolutely right. There's a chance now to really, you know, be braver in our decisions um, and and to be to recognise then that you have the wherewithal and a huge amount of experience actually behind you for you to make that step forward and not to to be too inhibited by previous issues that didn't go right for you or challenges or when you did put your hand up and and offer to do something and it may not have gone your way but to be to have a sense of that self-fulfilling prophecy a sense of self-belief that actually if you are going to put forward and there is a risk involved that there's a little bit of a calculation involved in the risk and you know that you're able to see a perspective of a bigger picture if it all goes wrong what's the worst thing that can happen Mm -hmm. but certainly going forward and putting yourself forward do you know Carol in my career you know when I pushed myself a little bit forward or in in my business it's where you really grow it's scary, it's scary but you can really grow as, a, as an individual and you can look back and think Jeannie Mac you know what did I learn from that that was a great it was a great opportunity to be brave and I and I learned a huge amount yeah and you see perspective is a great thing and it's very difficult to have perspective right in the middle of Absolutely. of confusion so you know say you know before we let you go you know what kind of advice are you giving uh business leaders and um business operators in the current market, particularly across the planning, construction and property industries? Well, particularly in, in construction, I'm kind of, um, I suppose, asking some key questions of leaders, again, back to themselves. You know, what are the top three goals that they have over the next 90 days? Keep it short and sweet. Keep it very practical, you know, to, to, to move forward and at least start writing some of these things down. There's nothing better than to focus the mind. The second question I'm asking them is, is what are your key priorities and how are you going to make this happen? Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, they're in the moment, you know, it's there's quite a lot that falls in on that. But if you were to narrow it down to, to key priorities, two or three, what are they? The third area and I'm, I'm kind of asking and I'm pushing leaders, is how can you lead differently? And you mentioned bravery there. You know, how can you lead differently and what impact can you have as a result with your team? Can you get them more involved in relation to the current scenario? You know, obviously crisis is one, but then it's, you know, moving forward from that. You know, are there ideas to add greater value to client relationships? And can they, can you set up even mini think tanks to get your team involved behind this? But the fundamentals in all of this is to stay honest and stay with that kind of optimism, but grounded in reality. And I, I believe that that's, that's served me very well uh, in the past, uh, that, that you keep those honest communication going with the team, um, but that, that you have an optimism, though, too, in relation to where the business is going. But certainly, if any leader needed help or support, to reach out. You know, Carol, sometimes it can be a lonely place, you know, and, and to reach out, there's great support around. And the government, Minister Humphreys, announced additional support yesterday, as you know, and obviously through yourself, Carol, and also through the various different associations. So there's a lot of help and around and people are very willing, I'm finding at the moment, which is brilliant to help and reach out for, to, to people, which is fundamental. Yeah. 
Valerie, thank you so much. You know, a lot of what you're saying there, we're talking about in the context of the unfolding COVID-19 situation and the government restrictions, but actually an awful lot of what you're saying, these are things that uh, business leaders, but also businesses and individuals, they need to be doing. And they're probably things that maybe perhaps we all ought to be doing and maybe we don't prioritise because we don't think we have time. So yeah. I would suggest that over the next few weeks, People, this is this is the time. So, <laughs> Valerie, thank you so much. We'll leave it there. That was Valerie O'Keefe, CEO of uh, Clarity VP Consulting. We need to take another quick break and we'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. 93.9 Dublin South FM. And you're welcome back to Property Matters on Dublin South FM with myself, Carol Tallon. We are recording from home as the station operates remotely in full compliance with government guidelines. I'm delighted to be joined on the line now by Joseph Maddy, CEO of Digital Construction Technologies Group. Um, so, Joseph, you're very welcome. Good morning, Carol. How are um, things? Good, thank you. Joseph, I remember our first conversation, I think, was back in about 2016 or 2017. I was interviewing you for uh, the CIF Construction Magazine about BIM, and you were definitely seen as one of the um, emerging leaders in the digital um, in the digital construction technology uh, space. So I wasn't at all surprised to hear that you had gone out on your own the following year. So tell me a little bit about your background in construction. Yeah, actually, I remember, I remember that meeting up and, and I suppose it's, yeah, a, a lot's happened since then. It has. Um, uh, yeah, no, I suppose moving moving on at that time, uh, I was with a contractor um, and uh, it just felt like the right time to go out because there was such a need in the market for, I suppose, digital construction uh, technology was was growing and there was there was a big need at the time. So I felt it was the right time to step out. But I suppose just giving you a little bit of context about my background, I suppose, uh, starting my time as an electrician, you know, as a Sparks on site, I moved into being an electrical engineer. And then I suppose when I was finishing in, in DIT in college, I moved into, uh, into BIM. Um, and, you know, I got exposed to the first course in DIT in terms of BIM. And then, you know, I think at that time, that was a big game changer for me to say, you know, there's not a lot of people doing this and, and, mm. and there's going to be a big need. And this is the way things are going to move in the future. So back, you know, that was, geez, I can't remember when that was. But back then I could see that this is the way things need to be. And this is, you know, this is definitely the way things will be uh, back then. So, um, so it was definitely something that I foreseen would be something that you know companies are going to need in the future absolutely yeah and look you were definitely on on the right track so digital construction technologies group was born in march 2018 yeah so yeah um you know generally a company stays in startup stage you know for for really generally it's a period of about three years but actually you've scaled very quickly internationally and i know the company now is more than uh, 20 staff. How many countries are you across now? Yeah, well, see, we, we, we have companies set up in different uh, regions, but mm. we also have staff that work remotely. Um, and, and you know, the way that we look at ourselves is like the IT of the construction industry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the IT work remotely. You know, they could have guys working anywhere at any time. Uh, and, and it's not really about... The, the old way of thinking of construction is that they want to see the person in a chair and they want to be able to tap them on the back. You know, we're trying to bring a different approach where we're deliverable based. Um, you know, if you want to get something finished, we'll have it finished and we'll get it done when it needs to be done rather than seeing somebody and saying, oh, you know, they're, that they're working. So we're trying to bring a different approach to, to the to the construction industry. Um, and that's how we, I suppose, can apply uh our methodology into different companies uh, and sometimes they like it and sometimes they don't so uh, we we are, our head office is in in dublin and uh, we're also spread in across in argentina we've uh, staff working in croatia and we staff working in south uh, africa also as well and um, which is great so i suppose it's it's just again all based around market need the growth is based on the need and, and that's what what's allowed us to grow so quickly Okay, and so so your staff obviously are very remote across the the country. Um, but are your projects remote? Like, are you dealing with projects right across the world? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we've we've prim- primarily our projects are within Ireland and Europe. Um, we we've not outside them regions at the moment. Um, okay. which which is great. 
Okay, excellent. Um, well, look, let's let's just break down because you know I, I'm very aware that you know we've been pushing the the prop tech and technology for the built environment agenda for a number of years now through Prop Tech mm. Ireland. But sometimes when you're doing that, you know, it tends to become a bit of a catch-all phrase. So digital construction uh, technologies, can you just break that down into you know what are the core pillars, the core pillars of your business? Uh, in terms of what we we offer, we, we yeah we kind of have. Uh, four areas or four pillars that we look at so in terms of uh, you just mentioned there in terms of property we we, we would offer a service called uh, a client's BIM representative uh, and this has massive potential and you know we see it as, a, as a, a big area or a big growth area for us and um, we are currently working with a number of property developers and what we do is you know we kind of step in as their representative in terms of the digital construction of of the building or the property or the scheme um, and we try to ensure that uh, you know everybody's delivering what they should be uh, ensuring that all the documentation all the information is structured in the correct manner um, and also you know it, it brings a lot of value to, to that uh, to our clients in terms of uh, making sure that they they're, they're getting what they're paying for because they I suppose digital technology enables them to to make a lot of savings. And, and what I would say is, there's a lot of money that's left on the table in terms of uh, what's what's available to them. Uh, you know, to get better visualization of of the buildings. They get oh, you know yeah. you know. So there's there's a lot of different areas. There's cost savings. There's program certainty. There's less waste. And um, so there's so many savings that they can attain from from implementing this technology or uh, process across across the, the construction process. And look, that absolutely makes sense. I've, n- I've never come across the term clients BIM representative. Um, so like, where do you sit in terms of the, the traditional players on a project? Um, well, from the start, we would look to get engaged right from the start, from from the concept. Again, it would depend on um, it would depend on the contract. Because where we step in or step out would depend on the contract, uh, but it, I suppose if if we're involved at the design stage, uh, we would ensure that, f- for instance, that the design have uh, the capability. So we'd have capability forms that would go go, and again, that would be de-risking for the client to make sure that the design team are capable. If they're not, we would make recommendations to you know say, well, maybe we need to look to outsource, or is this a risk to the project that you're trying something new? Maybe it's not for this project. Maybe it's for the next project. Um, so we we would uh, we would create the the scope of works. Um, also at the start to say you know this is clearly what the the client wants to attain over the full life cycle of the construction and then the management of the building. So I suppose that would be another area that we would look at. Um, just to give you I suppose some some idea of of the scope that we would take. Okay, and but that's almost. Um... Is, is it fair to say that's almost an ancillary service? Like BIM modeling actually remains the core of your business. Yeah, BIM modeling is is the core of what we do. Um, and again, it's yeah, it, it, we we try to approach this in it in a different way also because we try to integrate into companies. Um, where what we what we find is a lot of other uh, consultancies. Um, they they kind of just offer a BIM service where you know they're. Once they deliver a model that's um, finished, but what we try to do is we try to integrate into the companies. So, you know, the kind of win-win is we need to make sure that that they succeed. And then when they, I suppose, when they look good, we look good. Um, so if we're doing uh, a mechanical or electrical project, our guys like, are available um, whenever they need them. They can pick up a phone, they can call them. And and if we have deliverables to get out, we get them out together to make sure that we can, we can hear our dates and we meet our program. So, that's how we try to, um, I suppose, integrate into their company. And if we need that, we wear the high vis and, and sometimes we have, have their company email. So, again, it's just about integrating and, and trying to become part of, of the, the, the client's company that we work for. And look, that, that's almost like you're you're an outsourced member of the team for the yeah. for the duration of the project. And yeah. look, last week, last week we interviewed um, and we spoke with, uh, Shane Dempsey of the CIF and okay. you know he was talking about when construction restarts you know when people return to sites you know that mm. haven't been operation the non-essential yeah. sites that actually um, because because essentially they're going back to a very changed workplace you know that it may be a thing that there's a 
shift sh- working in shift to to comply with social distancing um, and other requirements that will be part of the new workplace um, and that will need to become the new normal as such. But he was talking about how some of the unique features of BIM, like, for example, uh, clash detection, you know, suddenly these are going to be so much more than a nice to have. These are actually going to be essential tools to keep to to ensure social distancing on projects. So is that something that you've been focusing on in the last week or 10 days? In terms of our, yeah, we, we're actually part of the, the COIF. Um, mm-hmm. So we're actually the first uh, virtual design and construction uh, company to become a member of the COIF. So um, I'm on the further row um, virtual design and construction working group mm-hmm. within the COIF. And we've been working to try put, I suppose, a pack together for uh, our members in relation to uh, after this, uh, what's what happens afterwards? You know, for the for the companies that aren't, you know, or and as they would say, like the, the big players, what like they're not their standard process wouldn't be, you know, to have the 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 teams and all of this, these processes and procedures in place. So we we're looking to put a, I suppose, an information pack together to to advise them on, on, I suppose, communication, collaboration platforms, uh, the common data environment, uh, the utilisation of BIM and 3D and 4D uh, construction sequencing, um, how drone footage might assist them in their, you know, in their projects, uh, looking at time-lapse cameras and technology and other technologies that's available that may assist them when we go back to, I was going to say the norm, but when, when we come back to, to, to walk after this, this Well, break, whatever. You know, while, yeah. we, while, while we figure out what the new normal is going to be mm. and what the changed workplace is going to look like. Um, yeah. so look, you know, I, I, I was on your website and, you know, you talk about digital collaboration solutions. So is that where you are bringing in all of these um, ancillary technologies that can be, I, I suppose that need to be run seamlessly across a project. You know, th- yeah, that's one, yeah. that's one of the problems that we have at the moment. We see it across the prop tech and on the construction technology side. You know, there are so many uh, innovators working on individual solutions, and it's not until somebody almost packages them together as a you know as a comprehensive, a holistic solution that they start to get traction. Because what we see is that all of these sm- all of these individual tools deal with individual problems. And the reality is um, companies need to prioritise what problems get resourced. They need to prioritise what solutions they can bring in or they need to at least do it in a staggered approach because they just don't have the resources to to get everything in together. But also they don't want to be operating under seven different platforms. So how do you ensure, you know, how do you streamline that for businesses and for, for companies when you go in? Well, is it, I suppose in terms of streamlining uh, with companies, we, what we generally do is we would go in under uh, the premise of we, we look at a current state analysis. So we go into a company and we would look at the different departments. Uh, what do they currently utilize? What's the current software that they utilize? What's the current hardware? What's the resources? And we, we go in and we invest, investigate across the board. And we like to, to speak to different departments because everyone has their own uh, opinion on how... Uh, they operate and what's their pr- processes, how they communicate. Uh, and it's funny how, you know, when you talk to different departments, how they assume that certain aspects of the business work. Uh, so what we generally like to do is go in, do the current state and see, as, as you mentioned there, you'd have different solutions. And then what we would do is we'd make a recommendation um, on what's the best way going forward. In in some instances, we go in under the premise of a grant, which is available. It's an Enterprise Ireland grant. And sometimes, you know, the, the companies would just ream us. They, they would, you know, touch base with the company and say, look, we'd like you to come in and review our current process and procedures. We want to streamline how we do things. We want to go paperless. Uh, like, as you mentioned there, this is a collaboration solutions. Sometimes I just get a call. Uh, and you know, say, Joe, look, can you help us out? We want to get, we want to get the models in the field. How do we get them there? You know, out, out on site. Uh, one solution that we did recently was the Colin Cube, uh, which is for Colin Construction, and and it was literally putting the container in a field, uh, putting in some touch screens, making sure we could get the model out there, make sure we could get Wi-Fi, uh, making sure that we could uh, enable the staff to have video calls in the middle of a construction site with with no tools that they could walk in and they could they could have a call, look at a model, mark up some drawings and then go back out. So again, it's it's creating solutions. It's kind of a, 
it depending on the need. And, and we've done that for a number of clients. So it just really depends on, on the needs uh, will will depend on the solution that we deliver. OK, uh, look, I, I, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, mm. but it's something that I just don't seem to be able to get a handle on. You know, where is the industry in terms of embracing um, embracing digital technologies, our construction industry, you know, where are we on the digital transformation scale? I think we're a lot more developed and mature um, uh, across the board than uh, companies in terms of the construction sector than, than they used to be. Uh, mm-hmm. So they're embracing it because they can see the value and the savings. Uh, and, there's, and there's so much value across the board. Um, and and as I just mentioned, like a lot of times I'll be brought in to do a code and state, but then also to implement technologies. And a lot of times there's, there's, there's issues with that because there's always that resistance to change. Uh, and if it's not, I suppose, fed in from the top down and given the support from the top down that, yeah, we want to implement technology. We, you know, we're, we're going to implement this across the country or co- company across the country or, you know, if, if they're international. Um, and then uh, back in it, you know, so, you know, saying, you know, if they're having a town hall meeting saying, this is the vision of the company, this is how we're going to do it. Um, so uh, I suppose different companies at different are at different stages of the maturity. But, it, you know, you can see across uh, the companies that have embraced digital technology, uh, the, the value that they are gaining, uh, not just by uh, savings on site, but actually enabling them to, to win different projects because they can go to the, the the, the client and say, look, we're using this technology. We can guarantee costs. We can show you that we're going to meet our program by utilizing the virtual technology uh, to show you how we're going to build it in, a phys- in the physical environment. So it's, uh, yeah, it does just, again, there's di- different, um, different well, that, elements are different stages. So, yeah, well, look, that, that seems to be indicative of a positive trend. Mm. You know, in your opinion, you know, how likely is that tre- trend? Um, to to be put kind of on the fast track as a result of COVID nineteen. Oh, it, it it a lot of like a lot of projects now. We we've got more projects in this week, um, yeah. and I'd say it's more than likely because uh, companies want to go virtual. You know, they yeah. want to move it to virtual. So we've got we've got a number of projects that's that's gone on online that we're actually going to kick off next week. Okay, uh, well, you so, work uh, you work across what uh, residential, pharmaceutical, data centers. Um, they, they're the sectors you're across at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, we we again we they were our, they be our, our 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 main like we're working on essential projects. So we're working in Dublin Airport at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, working on a large uh, pharmaceutical plant. We've a number of uh, data centers in Ireland and Europe that we're working on, uh, and then also a number of residential developments that. That we're working on, so they, they would be our, our our core sectors that that we're on at the moment. And as I, as I said, it, it's you know if you look at that central project, and um, we're still working to make sure, as as you mentioned earlier, clash detection. Look, we can we can still keep the show on the road, uh, and and like you know wh- whether we're on site or we're off site, we can still make sure that we're solving the problems that we're making sure that we can we can uh, install the services on site. And, and resolve as many issues as we can within the virtual environment uh, to ensure that all the issues are solved when, you know, when the guys okay. come on site. Well, listen, before we let you go, Joseph, you might just tell me, uh, you're really for our for our listeners here, you know, how can they be using this time while we're currently in shutdown? You know, how can, how can construction um, leaders be using this time to step up their innovation game? Um, again, just as I mentioned, I think companies should look at the current process, just do a quick snapshot, you know, during this period of downtime, just get a quick uh, snapshot of the current processes uh, and then maybe do a needs analysis and say, right, this is where we are. This is where we, we want to be. And then go and investigate different technologies that's out there. Uh, and again, if, if companies, you know, d- don't have um, the knowledge of, of what they need to look for, well, then, you know, we're always here. DCT are available to support anybody that, that needs uh, support in implementing or investigating new technologies. So we're here. Super. Well, look, there, there's a great starting point. OK, we leave it there for now. That was Joseph Maddy, CEO of Digital Construction Technologies Group. Um, thanks again, Joseph, for talking to us today. That's it from us today on Property Matters. Thank you for listening in on Dublin South FM the show for Property Matters. Get in touch with the show by emailing hello at iPropertyRadio.com or on Twitter at iPropertyRadio. Also, my thanks to Peter Rice on sound who has a 
extremely difficult job these these current weeks. And also to our show producer, Kate Talon on Hear Me Roar Media. We're back at the same time next week from myself, Carol Talon and all the team here. Stay safe. <laughs>